Today, we talk about how to develop what our guest calls super sensible perception, knowledge of the higher worlds through entheogens, prayer, and non-dual awareness. Sounds interesting, doesn't it? Hi, it's Cheryl Sitz, and I'm back with another episode of Exploring Possibilities. We broadcast our entire library of shows at journeyofpossibilities.com, and now we're also available through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, CastBox FM, and my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Cheryl Sitz. And we will speak with Dr. Shelley Joy in just a moment. Throughout these shows, I'm always talking about Mario Rosales' incredible technology skills, helping me launch the podcast, my website, my YouTube channel, and he can still help you with all those things. But for five years now, he's been working on a special project, and now he's finally ready to launch it. And I'm excited for him to tell you about it because they're absolutely beautiful. Tell us. Well, what I have come up with, I call it astral fractals, and that's astro, A-S-T-R-O, like astrology. And why is it an astral fractal? It's very simple because it uses your birth date, your birth time, and your numerology of your name. With that, I put it into this formula that I've worked on for, for a while. Yeah. <laughs> and it creates a fractal and it colors it and it gives you this beautiful portrait of you. And at first when I got it, it's like, what was it? What's it for? Well, if you meditate in front of it, take it to a ceremony, or if you just want to look at it like a piece of art, it's beautiful. You can look at it at my website at Astro, A-S-T-R-O, Fractals, F-R-A-C-T-A-L-S, AstroFractals.com, and that'll take you directly to my website. The base package is a digital picture of it, and then I have options that go higher in price for different types of things, 8 by 10s tapestries, I mean, you name it, it's whatever you want. And they are beautiful. Astrofractals.com. Way to go, Mario. I love it. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing what everybody's fractal looks like. And you even have famous people on there. So check them out. Astrofractals.com. Joining us today is Dr. Shelley Renee Joy to discuss her book, Developing Supersensible Perception. Dr. Joy received a degree in electrical engineering from Rice University before working with John Lilly on interspecies communication and then completing a doctorate in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness at California's Institute of Integral Studies. You can learn more about Dr. Joy's other books, artwork, and more at ShellyJoy.net. Welcome, Dr. Joy. Well, I'm glad to be here up with you, Cheryl. I'm so delighted you could make the time for us. So it's interesting. We broadcast this show from north of Houston, located in Texas. And I saw when I was looking through your bio, of course, that you had a physics scholarship to Rice and then graduated, I believe, an electrical engineer and then managed to get into more of this kind of esoteric writings about meditation and accessing higher realms of consciousness and being an artist. So it kind of seems like you're firing on all cylinders here. You've got a lot going on. How did that evolve? <laughs> yeah, how did that how did that happen? <laughs> well, I was really good at science and math in, in high school and you know, my dad sort of channeled me into engineering. He was an Air Force colonel. And so I I, I first studied physics. I was on a physics scholarship to Rice. Uh, full tuition, which was nice. Yeah. And uh, the second year, I switched to mathematics, pure math, which I really liked. And then I got intrigued with electrical engineering. I had been a ham radio operator since I was 12. I built a radio station, and I loved communicating or trying to communicate with uh, people far away using invisible energy. I thought that was so cool. So I... Um, I graduated with an electrical engineering degree, and just before I graduated, I married another student who was in the art department. And, um, well, we went to California for the summer, actually, just before my, my fifth year. It was actually a five-year engineering program. So we went to California, and uh, I was working as a programmer at Point Magoo at the Pacific Missile Range. I was a summer intern. And... All our friends were artists because, you know, my spouse was an artist. And so we gravitated toward artists who were uh, sort of hippies back then <laughs> and uh, artist hippies. And I found myself talked into going to the beach uh, on Big Sur and taking LSD. Um, you know, as, as an engineer, I probably wouldn't have done that. But I was really always kind of religious when I was a kid. I was brought up as a Catholic Roman Catholic, and I had read something in uh, Time magazine saying, you know, people who take LSD experience, uh, they say they experience talking to God or, or 
are communicating with God. And I thought, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> even as an engineer, I, I just wanted to to see what was there, if that was true or not. Anyway, uh, we took LSD at night around nine at night on, on the beach on a beautiful, clear night. And that night, I, my uh, I was totally, well, totally <laughs> blown away by what I experienced. <laughs> and um, the upshot of that experience was, you know, for our final year in engineering, you're supposed to decide on what you want to focus on in, in your future career, what you want to do research on. or, or and, and I really wanted to be a researcher at the time. I kind of wanted to go on for a Ph.D. in engineering and do research uh, on maybe how the heart worked or how the brain worked. But uh, to, that night uh, on the beach, uh, experiencing all these very directly, I was experiencing other conscious entities, sort of I was in a space a vast space where there were other beings. They weren't physical, but they were very clearly uh, aware of me, and I was aware of them. And there was some kind of communication going on. Of course, it's very hard to remember once you, you know, once you're no longer stoned on a drug like that. It's very hard to remember exactly what happened. But the impression was that, wow, this is something I really want to research: is consciousness. Uh, just what is consciousness, and and what are these other entities that you experience? You know, are they are they just something my mind makes up, or are they something really in the cosmos? And uh, I think it, that that experience sort of made me feel like dedicating my all of my future energies toward trying to understand what consciousness was in terms of electrical engineering and, and physics. And, um, you know, when I started looking around uh, for other schools for graduate work, there was no interest at all in consciousness per se. Uh, the closest I got was psychology. But back then, and even now, most psychology is like uh, studying behavior, you know, human behavior and using statistics to, you know, if 500 people do this when this happens, and they try to uh, come up with ideas of how the, how the mind works and how to cure um, mental issues. But I, I just wanted to, to, to discover consciousness, uh, how it connected with the universe and, and, and science. So... Um, what I discovered was that there were writings, a lot of people had written about it, and they were all mystics or saints, um, but there were a few highly educated people throughout the last couple of centuries who, I was always a sucker for people with PhDs, I thought, oh, if you have a PhD, you really, you have a good brain, and <laughs> you've studied pretty hard, and you know a lot. So uh, one of the people I discovered, this was after graduation, was the writings of Rudolf Steiner. And the reason was he wrote most of his things about 100 years ago, the turn of the last century. Um, he had actually studied engineering uh, at the university uh, uh, in Vienna. Uh, actually, it was the uh, Vienna Institute of Technology, kind of like the California Institute of Technology back then. And I was fascinated by Steiner's writings because um, when he was in his 30s, he started becoming very interested in in consciousness and ways of uh, helping the your awareness evolve so that um so that you could you could uh, actually perceive what he called higher worlds and entities in higher worlds and i thought aha that sounds like a connection to the things i saw or experienced with lsd in fact he wrote his dissertation in 1894 on intuitive thinking as a spiritual path uh, we've in actually had another guest on here Oh, it's it's been a while back now. Her name was Ritika Arya, and she actually came on. She had she works with the Waldorf schools and with Rudolf Steiner's Anthroposophy, and and so she talked a lot about that too. So for any of the listeners that want to go back and learn more about that too, you may want to just search for Ritika Arya and uh, on exploring possibilities, and you can hear more about Rudolf Steiner's work as well. But that's kind of where you came up with the title for this book, or the super sensible perception. That was his phrase, wasn't it? Well, yes, actually, he wrote, he wrote a book called The Acquisition of Supersensible Perception. And uh, he, he used that phrase in other books, too. And so that's, that's, uh, that's, that's where I got that phrase, I guess. And um, he did found the Waldorf school system. Right now, there's about 400 Waldorf schools in the world, I believe. Uh, most of them are in Europe, but there's, uh, there's, there's a number of them in the United States and in California. They're private schools. And they uh, further his idea that there's three ways of thinking. This is pretty key to his thought. There's three different ways of thinking. And um, thinking is a way of, of perceiving 
certain things. So uh, there's imaginative thinking, active thinking, and intuitive thinking, according to Steiner. The imaginative thinking, uh, it's the kind of thinking that a child or a baby and a child have. It's a natural uh, way that we perceive patterns with our eyes and ears, you know, perception. It's sort of uh, uh, an emotional, imaginative way of, of, of learning. You know, child's children copy, you know, they observe and then they copy and they repeat things and that's how they learn. Well, as we get older, uh, we, go to, we go to school, most of us, and we develop what he calls active thinking. And education uh, sort of hones our active thinking. So our mind becomes kind of like a laptop, you might think. We're able to uh, use words as symbols and connect them. And we're able to uh, compare different ideas, you know, using words. And uh, it, it's, it's very intellect. It's developing what we call the intellect. And it's really, uh, physiologically, it's a, it's a left hemisphere of your brain activity. That's where most of the language centers are, they've discovered. And um, whereas the imaginative thinking is pretty much comes in with a, the right hemisphere of the brain. So you might think that the, the left hemisphere is sort of a masculine intellectual uh, uh, flavor of thinking. And the right hemisphere is more of a feminine, uh, a broadband, emotional um, uh, sensory way of, of putting things together. But there's a third way of thinking that Steiner said is really important and is uh, neglected uh, quite often, intuitive thinking. Intuitive thinking comes, well, the word intuitive, intuitive is um, being taught from within, making some connection within you and, and being taught. And what Steiner thought was that there's a there's really, two, there's really two, two selves within us. There's an external sort of an ego self. And then there's a deeper, uh, a deeper self that most people, uh, many people, don't connect with very much. And it's through intuitive thinking that this inner space uh, connection to sort of a, a, what he calls the higher worlds comes, comes to, to fore. And the people who've developed the intuitive thinking have been traditionally uh, mystics and saints and um, some people, uh, like Steiner himself and, um, well, who else could I say? Maybe uh, John Lilly. I actually worked with John Lilly, who was a, he was also an engineer and he had an MD. And he was, a, an, I would consider him to be a psychonaut. Uh, psychonauts to me are people who explore consciousness, much like... Uh, Argonauts or aquanauts, people who ex used to explore the oceans. The new frontier, I really think, is exploring the psyche, exploring consciousness. So Steiner said that to really become a balanced human being, we need to develop all three ways of thinking, the imaginative thinking, the active thinking, and the intuitive thinking. And so he developed uh, ways of teaching in the Waldorf schools that uh, ensured that people would would be able to develop all three. Unfortunately, in our modern culture, um, we're moving away from that in, in uh, you know, public education and even private education because uh, we're focusing more on, on, on verbal uh, skills and uh, you know, skills that are marketable, like accounting and engineering and things like that. And even in uh, public schools, a lot of the art programs and the music programs are being dropped in favor of uh, developing the, the thinking, the active thinking mind, you know, our laptop computer mind, trying to make us more like computers in a way. Um, it's, I mean, it's not a bad thing, except it's, to Steiner, it's, it's, um, you're losing the balance of the three that work together. Well, you know, and how do you, I want, to, I want to hear how you feel about that, because you do a great job of synthesizing Steiner's work, but then you spend the rest of, of this book kind of blending your education. I have a feeling that you're, you have a pretty passionate perspective about that as well, about us using our intuitive thinking and maybe developing that more in our youth and, and making a space for that in our culture. Well, definitely, yes. I, and, you know, I, I actually, well, I was married to an artist, so in a way that was very fortunate because I actually started painting myself. I mean, I got dragged around to a lot of art uh, art shows and, and uh, galleries and things, and, of course, I helped. Uh, we had a lot of conversations with other artists. So I think it's fairly unusual for an engineer, a young engineer, to really get thrown into the art world. But I started painting myself, 
And sadly, this led to the separation of our marriage. I think there was, uh, I think there was a feeling of competition or something. <laughs> Only room for one <laughs> artist per household, huh? <laughs> but, uh, but actually, then my then I kept trying to to paint. I was in New York, uh, living by myself in a loft, and I really wanted to break into the art scene so that I could make a living painting and stay home and read and study and meditate and and paint. And when I say meditate, I discovered uh, or I thought that through meditating, through learning contemplation, I would be a better artist. And I had read this, uh, I was really interested in Carl Jung for a while. In fact, I had his whole collection of essays. And um, there was one essay by one of his students called Art and the Collective Unconscious. And and the, the, the main idea of this essay really, really hit me, was that if you learn to, to sort of quiet your thinking mind, your normal verbal mind, then the collective unconscious, the, these higher worlds, would flow through you and through your paint into the canvas, and you would be able to uh, create artifacts that would that would help heal and uh, it would would help the culture that you're in, you know. And and so I started learning to meditate. And luckily, I was in New York City, so at the time there were there was an opportunity to study many different ways of meditating. Um, for a while, I got really involved in uh, Tibetan meditation. There was a, a, a Tibetan man named, many people probably are aware of. His name was Chongyang Tulku uh, Rinpoche. And he, he started a, a Naropa in Colorado, a really good school for meditation and studying consciousness. But I, I uh, hung out with some of his people and stuff in New York. Anyway, I, I, I started learning to meditate and I practiced First, it was really hard. For I would set a timer for ten minutes, and um, it was really hard to to let go of my thoughts, you know, because the thought would come up, "Oh, how long have I been meditating?" And you know, or you know, what did I, what am I going to have for dinner? I guess there are <laughs> things that everyone who they first start to try to meditate has a problem with. And um, I discovered that if I said a few prayers, prayers I had learned in, in Catholic school. I would say a few prayers. I knew one in Latin, the, the Lord's Prayer. If I said a few prayers first, it sort of acted almost like a, a transition from my normal thinking to the quiet of intuitive thinking that, that Steiner talked about. And so um, in New York, I was able to go to a lot of bookstores. I went to Weiser's bookstore and found amazing books. That's where I actually discovered Steiner and Teilhard de Chardin and a few other people who've really uh, influenced me quite a bit. Uh, Weiser's bookstore was like two blocks from where I lived on the Lower East Side. And I've been collecting books ever since. I'm a very bookish person, but I've also been practicing meditation. But I think Steiner, of all the people I've studied, has the clearest techniques for developing what he calls super sensible perception. And it's almost a, most of my career, though, was in, in engineering, and I shifted towards uh, software development. And in learning software development, uh, I realized that there's a, a lot of parallels between uh, the way we think and the way we're developing software systems. So what I think now is the intuitive thinking connects you with something within you that is almost like a, a cloud computing uh, system where, you know, you, you, the universe is full of consciousness. Um, in fact, the, the philosophy of that is called panpsychism, that everything is conscious in some way, you know, even a, an atom or an electron or a stone. But human consciousness has developed much more, much more sophisticated so that we're able to do the active thinking, which has led to all of our devices like iPhones and buildings and all kinds of really great things. But in, in developing our active thinking, many of us have lost touch with the... Uh, intuitive thinking that Steiner uh, pushed. And I think that's why so many people in the West uh, in the last 30 or 40 years have become more and more interested in Asian philosophies and uh, the Asian teachings of how to, how to meditate. So uh, with my electrical engineering degree, I worked for five years in New York, and I tried painting all the time, you know, in my spare time, because actually I, I loved painting more, <laughs> more than electrical engineering, although I was good at the engineering I found the painting more challenging, and the painting led to more meditation. So I fun, finally found uh, really what I thought was one of the best uh, book, the best teachings for meditation. I wanted to really understand the details of how the mind works during the meditation uh, process, and it's Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. 
it's a collection that um, Patanjali was an Indian uh, back in about the the, the fourth century um, A.D., about 1,600 years ago. He started collecting all of the wisdom from previous generations of uh, of yoga teachers on on the art of meditation. So I was trying to understand um, these sutras, and I got two or three different books. Each one was a different translation, and I saw how they're all such different. You know, they would translate different words totally different. And um, about the time I, I discovered there was a school in, in California, in San Francisco, that called the California Institute of Asian Studies, I actually learned about this. I, I took a workshop with Alan Watts, who was a hero of mine back then. I think I read everything he wrote. Um, Alan Watts, uh, at the workshop during lunch, told us that there's a new school opening in San Francisco in which the teachers not only have sort of academic backgrounds, so they know the, uh, they know the, the, the material from an academic viewpoint and have read, had read quite a bit, but they were also, unlike many academics, they were experiential. In other words, they practiced uh, what they were learning about. So that really intrigued me. Um, so I, I made plans, and after about six months, I actually applied and was accepted to a graduate school in California. And I moved out to San Francisco, and I enrolled in a, a master's degree in Asian philosophy. And I really wanted to study Sanskrit, which my, my father thought was actually pretty bizarre, being an Air Force <laughs> colonel. He, he wasn't terribly supportive, but but um, at that time, I was pretty independent. So I, I took... Uh, two years of Sanskrit, so, mainly so I could translate on my own, you know, and think about uh, Patanjali Sutras to try to understand consciousness and meditation, which is, you know, they're very subtle things, and, and the words are fairly abstract uh, unless you experience some of the things. So I, I managed to finally get a master's degree. Uh, I think my, my master's thesis was called uh, The History, Philosophy, and Practice of Tantra in India. Now, Tantra has kind of a, uh, a, a wrong a misinterpretation in American culture. People think, they hear the word Tantra, and they think, oh, it's the yoga of sex. Well, it's not really, it's not really, Tantra means, uh, it, it sort of comes from a Sanskrit word, which means sort of a, 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 a weaving. And the idea was that Tantra was almost like engineering. Tantra, the Tantrics took what was practical. They weren't, weren't based on any particular single religion, they, they wanted to know what works. And whatever worked, uh, whether it was uh, drugs or uh, certain kind of breathing techniques or moving techniques or meditation techniques, they tried to develop a system of practical techniques for meditating to, to do what Steiner talked about much later, was, was be able to perceive things that we're not normally able to perceive. In other words, to, to come in contact with higher worlds, invisible worlds of conscious entities. And as an electrical engineer, I, I now see that these conscious en entities within the cosmos, it's almost like cloud computing. You know, you, cloud computing is there are many, many computers out there, and our particular computer can link to all of them and come up with a much richer uh, array of information and things than just being a very isolated little computer. You know, if you're just a little computer by yourself, how do you get more information into you? So the idea of uh, uh, intuitive thinking that Steiner professed, uh, it, it's really held my interest throughout, even throughout the, uh, my study of, of, of Tantra and Sanskrit. And I've been reading a lot of Steiner for the last 20 years. He, wrote, he, actually, he actually wrote, uh, I think he wrote and published about 43 books of his own, but right now there's 700 different publications about Steiner because he he went on a uh, he would give like four or five lectures a week all over Europe and so for a couple of decades he he became very articulate and uh, spread his ideas he was very much involved with Madame Blavatsky's uh, Theosophists for quite a while he became in fact a, the uh, I guess the president of the Theos Theosophical Society in uh, in uh, Germany for a while but he had a sort of a falling out with him because he was he was pretty christian he was he grew up in vienna near vienna and um he was brought up as a catholic and he thought 
Christ was an important element of 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 what he was interested in. In fact, he he in I think 1897 he had a big eye-opening experience during while he was meditating. He felt that he was directly in contact with the spirit of Christ, and this spirit told him that he was the the central element of many religions, although they called him by different names. And so um it, it just uh, amazed me that he was able to to break with a theosophist and start his own um, sort of a, a movement he called anthroposophy, anthroposophy, right. which is the science of humans, which involves, he thought theos- the theosophists were going too much to the East and Asian studies. He wanted to bring Christian values into it a little bit more and Western ideas. So that's pretty much uh, the background of, of, uh, of, of Steiner's uh, approach. Um, and right now, anthroposophy is pretty big in the world. There's there's thousands of uh, uh, followers, uh, people who study Steiner, and of course the Waldorf schools are are teaching children uh, the the three approaches that he said. You know, the imaginative thinking, active thinking, and intuitive thinking. So it would so almost go- seem, on the surface, like those three kinds of thinking would not happen easily together. For example, when I listen to you, you're obviously well educated and and you work a lot with with academics and research and and using that part of the mind. How do you balance that then with this intuitive thinking which almost requires you to get out of all of that completely? How do you balance that out for yourself? Well, I mean, I st- I still paint some. You can find some painting um I think 40 of my paintings, I call them super sensible paintings on my website, shellyjoy.net. But what I do every day is meditate. And I actually set a timer for 30 minutes. And for years, I've been meditating for 30 minutes a day. Sometimes I do it twice a day. The best time is around in morning, around dawn, and and in the evening, around sunset. At least that's what the uh, Patanjali and other teachers have said is a good time to meditate. Um what the meditation does is quieting your mind. You watch the thoughts as they arise, but you try not to engage with them. What I mean by uh, you try to quiet your mind, but but not uh, not ruthlessly. You just gently try to let the thoughts go, and you watch them. You listen. You really listen to your thoughts come up. In fact, uh, Saint Benedict, who was a uh, a Catholic saint, uh, he started the Benedictines. The first word of his famous book that he wrote um, is called Ascolta. It's Italian for listen. So when you meditate, the idea is that you listen for your thoughts, any thought that starts to come up, and you just let it come up and go. And if it's a, a good thought or a bad thought or uh, you know a trivial thought, you just don't engage with it because if you start to follow it and give it energy, it'll grow. And uh, Steiner's idea and Patanjali's also was that if you're able to really uh, sit in silence, you will start to experience uh, things which Steiner calls intuitive, an inner space network, a higher self, uh, what engineers might call the cosmic cloud computing of consciousness. And uh, you will start to perceive other dimensions. And what do I mean by other dimensions? Well, in uh, quantum physics right now, they pretty much... uh, agree that there are 11 dimensions and we're normally living in four dimensions uh the dimension of space you know space has a uh if you if you see the axis x y and z normally uh is how you find a point in space and then there's time time is a fourth dimension so with space and time you have four dimensions but um Over the last 50 years in quantum mechanics, they've had a lot of experiments with particle physics where they weren't able to really figure out why does, why does this particle go this way or split this way or, you know, it doesn't make much sense. And so they worked out the math, but the math requires that there are other dimensions. And they call this string theory or M theory is, is the latest version of string theory. And they believe there are 11 dimensions. But we live primarily within four, and our perceptions, our, our, our uh, visual perception and our, our oral perception are pretty much, pretty much just dealing with time and space, our daytime time and space. So what happens? Where are the other seven dimensions? Well, uh, according to the physicist David Bohm, 
reality is divided into two areas. There's the explicate order and the implicate order. And we normally live in the explicate order, but the implicate order is everywhere at the center, uh, at the center of every atom, uh, very, very tiny dimensions. In fact, it's called the, the, the Planck length. It's called 10 to the minus 35 meters. That way down uh, within that, uh, these little tiny holospheres, uh, 10 to the minus 35 meter diameters, the other seven dimensions are wrapped up. And the theory is that when you meditate and, and you, you, you start trying, you, 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 you have the will and the interest to try to contact these other dimensions, they will start to manifest. So it's, uh, it, anyone can do this. It doesn't depend on, on your education or lack of education, uh, how, how intelligent you are. You know, you can have, I guess, uh, the highest IQ or the lowest IQ, but if you practice meditation... And you learn, it's like riding a bicycle, I suppose, you know. It's hard to put in words, but by having an intention to try to listen and to pick up uh, what they call intuition, you start to communicate with something that's, that's linked to your very deepest level of consciousness. It starts to, it starts to manifest. And um, in Sanskrit, they call it the Akashic records that within these tiny, tiny spaces that you can communicate with, that all the information uh, that's generated in the outside external world is stored in this implicate order that David Bohm calls the implicate order or the frequency domain. And uh, this, it's, it's what mystics and uh, saints have communicated uh, in their own words throughout the ages. But uh, nowadays, not many people try to follow it. People we would call spiritual seekers do, but in the typical, I guess, typical person in, in the United States even doesn't. Although people who are religious, uh, they, they are also uh, developing intuitive thinking without knowing it. So, so people who are very, uh, they go to church a lot, they, you know, sometimes they're deprecated by the more liberal people around us. But, but just prayer, prayer is a way of, of uh, of releasing your normal thoughts and and developing the intention to communicate with you know angels or with God or or, or what Steiner called higher worlds. So, Doctor Joy, can I just ask real quick? How do you know if you're just imagining all of this? You know how do you you get your mind a little quieter and all of a sudden you start to have these really cool experiences. How do you know it's not just all your imagination? Well, the the proof is in the pudding. That what happens is people notice that things start going better for them in their in their daily life you know after they've been trying to practice meditation for a few weeks they'll really notice some beneficial effects in their life in other words synchronicity what carl jung wrote a lot about things things start falling into place and things start making a little bit more sense in other words even your inner sense of uh you start losing the sense of being confused and certainly there are many things to be confused about in our modern society, you know, politics, <laughs> the environment, um, you know, so many things. But, but through meditating, uh, uh, I don't think it's just your, you know, your, a delusion that things start going better. People really have, you've seen, you can read accounts that people write about where when they start to learn to meditate, uh, and, and prayer is also sort of part of meditation, um, it's the beginning at least, Yes. But, but I think people who pray and people who try to find some non-dual awareness uh, through through uh, zazen, through practicing zen, or in Christianity, there's a new movement called centering prayer. Um, the, the the proof is in the pudding, as I said. The result is that their life starts. People feel less confused, and they feel like they're getting some uh, some instruction from within. You know, it's. Uh, pretty hard to describe but uh it's it's very easy to experience you did a great and job then, that's exactly what it feels like to me too i just i know that sometimes i come back with insights or visions that someone might just say well you just imagined that you know how, how do you know that's real or whatever it's, it's real for me and it, it helps me in my life so i, yeah, I just yeah and how amazing you coincidence be, coincidences begin to happen in your life you know things you meet someone that suddenly you know you really resonate with, and um, I think 
I wish it was something that more public schools would try to teach children. And there are there is a movement toward this. The uh, the director David Lynch, who's done some pretty good movies, he's contributed several million dollars. He meditates. He's been meditating since he was, uh, I think, his teens. And maybe that has something to do with his movies being able to, you know, being so good. But he's he's contributed several million dollars of his own money to a program to teach elementary school kids and high school kids how to meditate, you know, even for five minutes. Um, I used to work in the World Trade Center as an engineer uh, years ago, and I was in the North Tower on the 64th floor. Whoa. And and during the coffee break, uh, we'd always have a 20-minute coffee break during the morning. So I would immediately go to the bathroom because nobody, everybody was out eating their rolls and their bagels. And so the bathroom would be really, really quiet. And I would just, uh, you know, go in a little cubicle, like a little meditation booth. And I would sit down and <laughs> meditate for, for five minutes or 10 minutes. You know, this is especially in the early years when I was just learning to meditate. And it really made a difference. You know, I would then, you know, then I would go out and be very refreshed. Um, if nothing else, you know, if somebody doesn't believe that meditation is going to connect you with higher worlds, there is a very real benefit for just uh, relaxing your brain, uh, sort of uh, let, letting your letting your energy uh, reaccumulate, and and just refreshing, you know, refreshing you. But they people who try it will find there's even more than just the the rest. They'll find they'll find themselves being re-energized, and often come up with ideas, new ideas that they, you know, very useful ideas. And this is a, uh, some of the in, in, intuition. You're being taught by something within you that's very deep, that's connected to, to what the Indians call the Akashic Records, the, the, the implicate order, where all the information resides. And, and all you have to do is try to reach down within you and find it. Uh, you don't have to be searching for anything very specific, but the main thing is during the practice, you're developing a bridge. You're developing uh, a way of connecting to something much deeper, uh, deeper than just your, your laptop computer brain, which is only worth wor working with what you were fed from the outside, I guess. You do a fabulous job of explaining all of that and, and linking together concepts that are as abstract as quantum quantum sciences, which, which I can't begin to understand. I never heard it explained the way you just did. So I love the way you, you weave all this stuff together. And this is the beauty of your book, Developing Supersensible Perception. There's a lot in there. You synthesize a lot of studies that you've done and people that you've met and practices that you've had into how to truly begin to develop this for yourself. So I think it's a fabulous book and I love the way you line it out. Well, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. And you know, my real effort has been in writing, trying to make these very uh, abstract um, ideas um, understandable to the average person. And to do that, I've actually included a lot of diagrams. I think I have 40 40 visual diagrams within the book, uh, you know, trying to explain things visually, because actually that's, that's our first way of thinking, what Steiner said, imaginative thinking, uh, where you can perceive patterns and understand things a little bit better than, than just in the linear way of words, you know, which words flow through time, and, and it's, it's just uh, really good to have some visual aids. So I spent quite a bit of time, luckily I was really good at Photoshop, um, when I was trying to get my paintings on a website, I took two courses on Photoshop, so uh, it's really a, a good skill to have if you're trying to develop diagrams and you know <laughs> visual visual aids for people. Yes, it is. Well, Dr. Joy, the time is just flying. You have so much wisdom to share with us, and that's why you've written so many books, and I have a feeling there's more to come. I hope so, anyway. They're, they're very delightful to read. So again, well, thank you. <laughs> we've been talking about developing super sensible perception, and I'll have a link to getting that book on the show. And I like to wrap up interviews by asking my guests if there is a parting thought that you would like to leave the listener with today. Yeah, I would say the parting thought is to everyone out there, whether you've uh, learned to meditate uh, in your own religion or some other way, try, try, just start uh, spending five minutes, five minutes, even in your driving your car. Like if you see the red, red taillights flash in front of you, 
take take an opportunity to say, oh, can I empty my mind for 60 seconds? You know, make it a little game because just the effort really has beneficial effects. Uh, I, you know, I can't urge people uh, anymore to to try to meditate, and and if they combine that with uh, their 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 religion that they learned when they were a child, that's that's even better, I suppose, because we all need to be able to to develop our awareness in these. Otherwise, there's a danger of being, you know, if we're not aware of things around us, you know, it's like a deer in the forest. If the deer is blind, it can be a dangerous thing. But once you begin to see in these subtle ways, you'll find things changing in your life for the for the better, really. Yes, I agree. I fully agree with that. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. I've had a delightful time talking with you. And listener, I hope you've enjoyed it too. Let us know what you think. We welcome your feedback and your contributions to keep the show going at journeyofpossibilities.com slash support. And whatever player you listen to us on, be sure and like us so others will find us too. And we will see you next time on Exploring Possibilities.